Great to be here. My name is Ishai. I'm the CTO at Linear B, and I'm going to talk about combining or pushing developer experience and developer productivity metrics into Backstage. Why you should think about this, how to approach this, do's and don'ts, and some advanced ideas. Okay. Yeah, so I'll start with a quick intro about uh, the world of SEI, Software Engineering Intelligence, and, and IDPs, and how these relate to each other. Then I'm going to drill down into what does it mean to place those metrics uh, in the IDP, and you know, main do's, do's, and, do's and don'ts, and then going a bit deeper, going beyond metrics, additional things that make sense in this um, um, combination of SEI solutions and IDP, uh, how they work together, and how you can get more advanced. Starting with software engineering intelligence. Uh, anyone here has heard the term SEI? Not much. How about Dora Metrics? Okay. So SEI is the name that Gartner gave to this market of tools and platforms that deal with understanding what's going on in my development processes, where developers are stuck, how efficient are we, um, and they, they call that software engineering intelligence or SEI. They're projecting this market to grow very fast uh, so that in a couple or three years, one of every um, two or engineering organizations will have such a platform in place. Linear B is one of the leading vendors in that space. That's why I'm here. That's why I care, care about this. Um, and if you want to, like the, the very quick proxy to what SEI is, First step, the base step is Dora Metrics. Everyone has heard about Dora Metrics, a very famous um, kind of framework to think about how can I measure the productivity of, of my development teams, of my DevOps processes. Um, so SEI goes way beyond just Dora Metrics, but the first step typically is let's get some metrics, let's get some visibility. How do you go uh, um, deeper? What's like an advanced solution in uh, SEI look like? So two main steps. One is start providing value to developers, whereas metrics typically cater towards managers and leaders. They want to measure, they want to understand what's going on, make sure they have efficient investment where in their developer organization. Moving to how do I actually help the developers move faster is one of the hallmarks of uh, a more advanced or complete SEI platform. So not just measure, help um, developers work faster. And the next step is actually automating work. So one step is to help developers move faster. The other step is to take away work from developers. Can we do some things instead of developers, do them automatically? So as a developer, I don't have to spend time on that. Um, so again, solving the problems, not just measuring them. These are, again, hallmarks of the more advanced SEI platforms. Yeah. Okay. I am not going to define IDPs in this conference, uh, but I will compare and contrast a little, like just a, um, a few uh, differences or kind of contrast in how IDPs approach the question of developer experience and productivity and how SEIs do that. So we'll start with the audience. IDPs typically are thinking about serving the developers. Right? My developers will log in, they will find things in the IDP, they will take action. Their day-to-day -day or you know, once in a while, I'm helping the developer. Um, whereas SEI, typically the, the first entry point or the, the, what, that's like the basic offerings and also the reason why organizations buy SEI typically starts with managers. I want to see what's going on. I want to understand our productivity. So that's one main difference. And these kind of coalesce when you think about SEIs going into like serving developers. And when you think about eventually even with IDPs, someone has to fund the project. So there's going to be a manager or a leader or a budget owner that cares about things and not just about, okay, let's give some help to the developers. They need numbers. The focus in IDP tends to be the services. These, these are my, the, my key assets, my code repos or equivalents that map into services. And I'm looking at the code base. I'm looking at the runtime. 
Is my code, is my code base configured correctly? Is everything set up? Is my service healthy? These are the main types of um, concerns you look at in the IDP. Where's my documentation, all of that. In the SCI, the focus is about the dev process. So it doesn't matter if I have five or, f or 50 or 5,000 services, what is the process that a developer has to go through to get a change per, like delivered to one of these services? It could be creating a new service, it could be fixing a bug, adding a feature. So thinking about a pull request or a ticket in Jira, how do I get things done? And what are the blockers? What is the process? Do I have to wait for others? So that's kind of a different approach to looking at things. Um, but a natural question would be, okay, how does that um, operational efficiency or, or the, these bottlenecks, how do these manifest in one service compared to the other? Is it easy to make changes in service A versus very hard to make changes in service B? So there's relation, but initially different focus. And then how do I help developers? So with IDPs, it's a lot about finding information, like the catalog, just you know, finding uh, the information I need to, to do my work. If you think about automations or self-service, it's about how do I create a new service using scaffolding or templates? How do I start something new? Um, how do I deploy or you know, make changes to runtime? And then with SCI, we, if you look at the advanced SCI platforms, how they help developers is focused about how do I get my PR uh, merged? How do I finish my ticket? How do I like, deliver my sprint as, as a team or as a team lead? Um, so it's a little more tactical in, in work items that don't always need an IDP to get things, like if I need to solve a bug and I'm already in the code base, I don't necessarily need the IDP for all of that. But in the IDP tends to have a little more focus on uh, the big steps. This is gonna save me half a day of setting up something. That's the, the you know, big savings, a little more rare compared to ongoing daily sa savings. Save me an hour every day or three times a day, uh, these things add up. Okay, so what if we combine them? IDPs already have, like their, I already have a user interface, right? It, this, it gives me a navigation system, a way for people to find information about the, their work, their the day-to-day -day work. Um, it's natural, like, and, and IDPs already show me numbers, they show me trends, they show me scores. So it's very natural to say, okay, let's get my developer experience metrics. Just an example, what a, like a DevX metric could be, how long are developers waiting to get a review on their PRs? We call that pickup time in Linear B. But if I'm waiting three days just to get a response for my pull requests, that I have a huge context switch. I can't think, get things done fast. I have to uh, work in parallel with multiple things. So it affects productivity. It affects my experience. That's an, just an example. Um, so it's natural. Why don't we push those numbers into I, the IDP? So you can discover them. You can see them in the context of your services or maybe of your teams. Um, all, all make sense. But I'm going to share a few uh, do's and don'ts, mostly don'ts, then you can you know, get the do's um, from them about what it takes to get it right, to make that uh, work for real and not just, you know, what looks like a good idea could be a little more difficult. So the first thing not to do is to fly blind. You can really ignore this and just yeah, use your standard IDP practice, not look at developer productivity and experience, not try to measure, but if you're flying blind and your developers deserve better because the way to improve and the way to fix things is to see them. So not doing anything is, is the first note. Start with getting some metrics, measure, understand your bottlenecks so that you can improve. And I put a picture here of the Accelerate book. That's what be, like, stands behind the DORA uh, framework. Uh, and basically began, uh, a, what is it, like the modern way of looking at and understanding why you should have short cycle times for your pull requests and understanding how more efficient delivery through um, better flow helps the eventually productivity of the team. Sorry, that's not what I wanted. 
Okay. Another don't is to just, okay, let's get some numbers and put them on a dashboard. I call this like slap on. Uh, there is a reason why vendors exist in the ACI space. It's not always easy or trivial to get correct metrics for DevX and DevProd. There's a lot of, of nuance on how to get the data, how to measure it, how to ignore the right outliers, look at human work versus bots. There's a lot of small details that matter. Um, and it's better to get just a few metrics, but get them right instead of getting a lot, but eventually have numbers that don't really represent what's happening and do not, do not really help the teams improve. So that's um, number one. Another thing to try to avoid is doing too many things or too, too many metrics. You can get a lot of numbers. You can put them on a nice dashboard, but is a developer or a team lead or even a, a manager looking at a dashboard with 30 numbers or 30 trends, is that really helping them understand what's going on? So it's not just about getting those numbers in, it's about having some sort of process or a way to action them. And it's better to have few that are high impact, proven in the field to actually help improve productivity, get them under control, understand them, leverage the information to get better, and then you can move on to more having like more metrics and move like improve in other ways. But uh, it's again, better to have a few that really matter that you can action on. I gave some examples here, pull request size. That's a very simple example. Not even, not always simple to measure because you want to ignore files that are not really part of the PR, but are technically there and so on. But a pull request size or batch size, if you're looking at flow terms, is a really great indicator of your uh, velocity or your productivity, your ability to move things faster. Huge PRs are very hard to review. They tend to get pushed and not reviewed fast. They're very risky to merge and deploy. All of these great reasons why this is a leading indicator of getting better at delivery. So it's a great metric, metric to put out there and start measuring and driving down. Cycle time, uh, basically the, the king metric, if you like, in the Dora or the dev productivity space, how long does it take me to get a pull request from first commit to production? So you can measure that. You can see that we are splitting this into four phases, but that's a great way to start looking at how long does it take us to get things done? Where are we stuck? What are we waiting for? Are we stuck on reviews? Are we stuck on getting things merged? Is it everything is merged, but deploy takes a long time or waits for approvals for weeks, whatever. All of these are very good places to start. And Dora includes that metric as one of the four metrics. So Dora is a natural place to start with four metrics. Another don't is to measure the wrong things. Do you want lines of code? Many lines of code. If you measure those and you, you, know, you push your developers to have more lines of code, you will have more lines of code. Is that what you want? Do you want more comments, more commits? So it's e sometimes the easy things to measure are the wrong things. You don't want to get those. That's not the, the right outcome that you need. Um, so you, you should focus on understanding the process and bottlenecks and, and measuring that, pushing those metrics into your backstage. Um, think about metrics that you want your developers to gain. If they're gaming the, 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 the metric and actually move getting better as a result, everyone's happy. Another don't is motivation. Why are you even doing this? Why are you getting those metrics? Why are you measuring? Is this about stack ranking your developers? Um, is this about um, improving the process, improving, like giving your developers a tool to improve? Or is this about a, like a yardstick to punish uh, developers or even teams that are underperforming? Those motivations mean a lot and your developers will, um, they will realize what you want regardless of what you say. It's about what you do. So motivations are, are key here and it's very easy to mess up a culture, very hard to fix that. Now I wanna go a step deeper. So we talked about you know, like general things that you can do, things that you should try to avoid where to start, simple metrics, DORA, cycle time, things like that. 
and it's you know pretty natural. You get a plugin or push those metrics, put them on a dashboard, some trends. That's a good start. What, how can we go deeper, and how can we get IDPs and SEIs to play even nicer together? So an advanced don't is metrics without context. So I have a number. Is this good? Is this bad? Is this something that I need to action? Having a context next to my numbers really helps me understand what they mean. I mean, when I'm looking at, I don't know, CPU utilization, I have the context. I, it's like percentage. Everyone knows that 100% is full. Uh, it's a bit easier to parse. But what does a cycle time of three days mean? So the first type of context is benchmarks. Use industry benchmarks or create ones for your own um, teams to help you understand whether this number is great, this is like the top 10% of what people are doing out there, or this is, you're really behind. So benchmarks, you can see an example here for cycle time, help you anchor the numbers you're seeing, and obviously where you're behind is typically where you will want to invest some cycles in improving. Look at the trend, look at change over time. Is this metric getting better? So it's not a number in isolation, it's more like, is the trend going where I want it? And I can use the benchmark to understand where do I need to stop investing and move my focus elsewhere. Because I'm already doing okay or good in some area. You can look at different teams to try to understand. If this team is doing much better in this area than others, why is that? How can I, I learn from how they're working and transfer that to the other teams? How can I unblock my other teams? Or services or repos or whatever. So. By contrasting, it's not about like who t which team is better, it's about which team is less blocked, which team has figured out something that maybe the other teams can learn. And always remember, your developers know best. So there is a lot of local context that will explain why the numbers are different or why there is a challenge in one repo or one service. And um, like just putting up measurements and numbers, that's not going to be enough. So the users for this are the developers, and they have the context to understand whether this is actually a problem or this is okay given the other um, information they have about the service. Maybe the service is written in COBOL and no one, no one knows COBOL here, it's legacy. It's gonna take us longer to, to make, make changes here, but it's a known quantity. We know why that is, we can move on. Staying at the surface level, so you push some numbers, you have a trend, you have some context, that's great. But in many cases, to actually go and solve, okay, I have a problem with my pickup time, it's, it's too long in this team. In many cases, the way to solve is to go into the details. Let your de developers debug the problem or the issue or find a way to, to improve. And in many cases, that happens through dr drill downs. So you can either you know, write some more UI to provide some of that drill down directly in the IDP or send users back to like the SCI platform to do the drill down. So now if, I, if I'm seeing a spike in some metric, I can go and understand, you can see an example here, all the way down to specific pull requests or specific tickets. Why was this delayed? We, now I can go have a conversation about specific details and maybe use that to unblock um, and understand the bottleneck that is happening here, how can I help my developers move faster? Another um, pitfall is to say, okay, I'm, I'm, sh I'm just gonna measure. I'm gonna visit this every month or every three weeks, look at the numbers, hope they're getting better. So just measuring is not enough and just inspecting at a cycle and even just you know thinking about how do I improve doesn't cut it. You need to go from measuring to improving. So the mindset is, how do I fix the problems? And measurements are just a tool or a way to start that conversation. Um, so you measure a trend, you measure, uh, I don't know, cycle time for a set of services or for your entire team or for some BU. But when you're improving, you're actually helping a single pull request or a single ticket or a single item move faster. And you're doing that for all items that the metric will improve. So you can improve very tactically and help the trend. Um, find ways to, do, to help your developers self-serve and um, improve how they communicate, improve how they pass on work to each other, all the reasons why things are getting slower. 
in many cases about communication, about awareness. So the more you can give your developers tool to actually um, solve or move faster in, a, in like a single instance of their work, not necessarily thinking about the metric, that, that the metric will happen, uh, will get better as this happens. In, eventually, automation is gonna be key. There's only so much that you can improve about how people work together, but if you can automate some work away, and for example, if I can make it so that 10% of the reviews, the code reviews, the PRs in my team do not need a human reviewer, I have saved a lot of time and toil for developers. And there are many cases, we have research about this, where people rubber stamp pull requests. Okay, this looks good. They're not really re reviewing. Maybe make that institutional. Make that a decision that, okay, some pull requests with some um, criteria or use some rules and context do not need to go through that process of rubber stamping. Let's save the developers time. So automation is the key to unlock a lot more productivity. You just don't do things, you have time to do other things. And in many cases, you can integrate back to, you know, from the, from the um, IDP, again, using the SCI platform to run automations. I'll show you a couple of examples here. So an example that goes beyond measuring numbers or measuring the, the, the key metrics is, is team goals. What you see here, basically three steps. You set, the team sets some expected behavior, desired behavior or contract in the team. We want to get our PRs merged within three days, right? That's, that's best practice for us. That's what we want to do. Once you set this up, you can get automatic nudges. For example, a pull request is already two days or two and a half days. It's still not merged. So the team uh, channel will get a, a Slack notification, a nudge saying, hey, this pull request is getting close to the limit or to the behavior threshold that you set. Maybe someone can help get this pushed along. So now the team has a chance to um, take that instance, solve it faster, improve the metric. And then you can track how you're doing as a team against the goal. Again, more numbers and trends you can show on the IDP. So I can measure the time it takes to uh, merge a pull request and use that as a metric, but I can also measure adherence to a goal or a behavior or a contract and use automatic nudges to Im improve the way the team behaves. If I wait for a month to see, oh, Last month, we, uh, we were slow to merge PRs. That's not gonna help me move faster. But if I get alert about a, a specific PR that's waiting, someone can pick it up and move, move on. I'm showing some additional examples of how you can use both nudges or smart alerts. On the left here, there's an alert that's like basically a direct message to developer. Someone asked you to review a PR, the PR is very small, a couple of lines of, uh, of, of change in the diff, so the whole diff is in the alert. You can see this, approve it in, in immediately and move on. This is like in Slack or MS Teams. So that's an example of automating some communication instead of you know, pers like manually slacking someone, hey, there's a po small pull request, can you take a look? We can automate a lot of that um, behavior and help the teams move faster. Or we can take automation and like a further step, we have a tool called Gitstream, which basically runs inside the, the PR, runs as an, as an action or similar, depending on where you're running your, um, your review process. And it can do things like automatically approve a pull request if it meets some criteria. So for example, it's a patch update from the Penabot on an area that I consider safe. I can configure it to automatically approve it or even merge it. In many cases, developers were not gonna review those, those PRs. They were gonna run the test. If everything passes, let's move on. So I can remove the human from the loop and save time. That's just one example. Or I can look at a sonar cloud scan and um, I don't know if the sonar is saying this, there's a high uh, value uh, or a high um, severity warning here. Gitstream can pull us, someone from the security team to be a required reviewer. Now they have to approve the PR before it moves on. So give you flexibility in how to move, the, move your process along. All of these examples go back to, okay, now I can show those automations in my IDP. What is actually triggering? What is actually running? 
are these getting used? So if I have that rule for Dependabot, how many PRs did it actually automatically merge or approve for me in the last month or week or whatever? So now it's, I can start getting the conversation towards ROI. I've done something to help developers or to automate. I can measure it, I can show that it's actually getting used and how much time it's actually saving me. And remember, eventually there's always gonna be some budget owner that needs to invest more or put more resources on the platform team. Um, and showing ROI is one of the key pains for platform teams because we're doing a lot of things, developers love it. Okay, are we moving faster? Show me the money. So now you can start thinking about, okay, if I installed automations that help th move things faster, I can measure those and start talking about saved hours and saved dollars. Focusing on just productivity, that's another uh, thing to avoid. Maybe your managers or your leaders want just more juice out of this, the, the team. But you always have to balance between productivity and experience. So measure, and, and they're related. Obviously, better productivity goes with better experience. But remember to always mix between your productivity metrics and your experience metrics. How long are people waiting? Are they frustrated by, I don't know, broken builds? Anything you can measure that helps understand their internal experience and their frustrations, which you know block them from moving faster. Developers want to produce, want to, to deliver. Uh, I know not all managers believe that, but we typically want to deliver. Um, so measuring the de developer experience is a key part, not just the productivity. And sometimes it's like it's an oversight, so try to avoid that. And always think, what can we automate? How can we uh, improve the DevX by automating? I think this is gonna be my last slide, and you didn't really think there's gonna be a talk here that doesn't mention AI. Um, that's another great thing to start measuring. And then another thing that we hear leaders of you know, developer organizations are always asking, is this thing helping us? What's the ROI on my co-pilot usage? I know my developers love it, is it actually giving us more? Are we more productive? So measure the adoption of Gen AI. How is it adopted in your teams? Are people actually using it? Gen AI is not just co-pilot. It's a, you know, automatic bots that create code or that review your code or that add tests. There's a bunch of use cases and this is growing. But measuring the adoption, measuring the impact, so you can use the key metrics that we discussed earlier to start understanding, okay, this is improving because of co-pilot or actually you can also look at delivery risk some things can be getting worse because of AI let's look at an example here this is an example dashboard where we contrast pull request where co-pilot was used versus ones that weren't we label those and we are able to say okay look at the difference the metrics look different so look at the PR size it's so much easier to get more code written I have a, the risk of having like bloat in my PRs, much bigger batches because, okay, I just, you know, I clicked a few tabs, I have a lot of a code, I'll just put this in a huge PR. So that is a risk you need to manage when you're adopting a solution or a, a new paradigm that helps create more code. What about reviews? I can use co uh, like Gen AI and, and bots that are creating, agents that are creating code to create 10x more code. Who is going to review that? Do I have the right process in place? to actually review or am I gonna hit a huge backlog of, of reviews which are also difficult? How do I review code that no one wrote? How do I defend it? Who defends it? Who owns it? All of these questions are uh, critical to delivering and if you're not measuring the multiple dimensions here, you're, you may see, okay, we're writing more code but we're actually stuck in delivery because of all these concerns. So measure all of these things, look at comparing and understanding Gen AI impact, that's gonna be key. And one more hint, if you've invested in automating some of your flows around code review and about around merge, you're also a bit readier to absorb all that amounts of new code coming in. So that 10X more code can be reviewed more efficiently because I've automated parts of my review process and my delivery process. So that's it, thank you couple of uh, calls to action here if you want to learn more.
And that's it.